going to be renewable energy, which is something that many of us are, are passionate about and something that many of us would like to see a lot more of in Virginia. And uh, just this last week, uh, it's become a topic of discussion uh, increasingly on both sides of the aisle with a new report coming out of the Attorney General's office telling us, as I, as I referenced earlier, that our current renewable energy laws are not working and uh, something needs to be done to fix them. So I'd like to introduce to you Chelsea Harnish, who is the newest member of the Virginia Conservation Network staff. We were able to bring Chelsea on this year as our energy programs manager, and I'm very glad we were able to do that, thanks to support from foundations and from individuals and, and donors, some of whom are in the room, uh, because it's unquestionable that energy is a major environmental issue and it's a major policy need in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and it's a place where I hope, uh, if not immediately this session, then over the next three to five years, we really can win the battle for true reform in Virginia. So, Chelsea, um, come on up and tell us all about it. For those of you who don't know, Chelsea formerly was on staff to the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, and before that uh, worked uh, diligently with the uh, offshore wind advocacy group in Massachusetts. So she is uh, here bring a lot of experts to us today. Thanks.
The trick is, is that the language in the bill says all non-nuclear. So what that means is that if you're exempting all of the energy that comes from nuclear, it really means that 10% of our energy needs to come from renewables by 2025. Um, and that is, quite frankly, abysmal. Um, solar, onshore wind, and animal waste to energy get double credit. The animal waste to energy is a brand new piece of legislation that was passed last year. Um, offshore wind receives triple credit currently. Um, for, for the utilities, since this is a voluntary program, if they do decide to opt in and they meet, the, um, they meet each step or each increment, they will get money. So, the question is, is the RPS working in Virginia? And unfortunately, the answer is no. The utilities have not built a single new project since the RPS was enacted in 2007. Matter of fact, Dominion, um, both, I should say, both utilities are meeting the RPS. They've opted in. But unfortunately, Dominion, what they're doing is that they are purchasing a lot of out-of-state renewable energy credits. And more than 70% of the power that they are using to meet the RPS was built before 1930. <laughs> yes, so this is not incentivizing new renewables, and it's not incentivizing the types of renewables that our group support. Um, as I said, they're using zero megawatt hours of wind or solar to meet the RPS. Um, and last year, the RPS was further weekend. Weekend, the governor had three separate bills that were passed through both chambers. One um, just clarified that landfill gas is a renewable energy, clearly something all of the environmental community opposed. Another piece allowed research and development to be included in the um, RPS. Overall, we do support research and development, but because these research and development in itself means that this is something, a technology that is not currently commercially viable. Therefore, it doesn't make sense that it's being uh, that it's included as part of the RPS. Um, so this is something that we oppose, just it shouldn't be in the RPS, not as something that we oppose outright. The third piece of it, um, or the third bill that was passed, allows, um, allows what's called combined heat and power. This is a little wonky technical, I'll try to make it easy, but Basically, um, for manufacturing, and this particularly benefited Mead West Vaco, which is a paper milling company, um, for their, um, their manufacturing facility where they make paper, they capture their heat and turn that into um, electricity. It's a very energy efficient process, um, and it's a process that I think all of our groups do support. The problem is, again, this is not um, appropriate to put into the renewable portfolio standard. This is not a renewable fuel. This is just an energy efficiency measure, um, and it should be um, benefited in a, in a different way. Um, so those are the three things that were put in last year, and again, we do feel that like those were further weakening of the statute. And on top of all of this, the utilities are getting big bonuses. Dominion is getting receiving $76 million over two years for, again, like I said, over 70% of the energy coming from facilities built um, before 1930. These are facilities that are already being, that are already running. These are not, we're not incentivizing new renewables. So um, it's really not fair that they are getting $76 million from each of us. They, they do get the money straight from the ratepayers. Um, and all they're using is very old hydro, municipal solid waste, um, and biomass. They, they do have the largest biomass facility um, on the East Coast, and, but it was built in 1994. So nothing was even built this century. So obviously, we want to make this stronger. In 2012, we took a baby step in that direction. Um, we successfully lobbied a bill that required reporting requirements. Um, each year, the utilities need to submit a compliance report to the State Corporation Commission on how they're meeting the RPS. And before, there weren't any specific requirements that needed to be included in this report, so they could just write whatever they wanted. Um, we, the environmental community, um, came together and we worked on a board a bill that passed unanimously to get three key pieces of information into those reports so that we could see some of the information that would be useful for us in further campaigns that we knew we'd be pursuing. 
Um, so we were able to make sure that in each of these reports, they had to put the decade the facility was built, the state that it was built in, and the renewable fuel type. Um, just on November 1st, we had the first round of reports come in since passing this legislation. Um, and obviously that's where we saw in um, Dominion's report that 70% or more of the energy is coming from facilities built after, or before 1930. APCO is still, they don't seem to understand the new language in the bill, um, and their reports, uh, we're still, still waiting for them to, uh, to give us certain piece of information, but hopefully that will resurrect itself, yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's, obviously that is just a small step because there's a lot of reform that needs to be done, but at least we know that this piece will help us in, um, in our fights in 2013 and beyond. So the 2013 legislation that is actually being spearheaded by Chesapeake Climate Action Network and Sierra Club, um, it has three main components. It only allows energy from facilities in Virginia to be used to meet the RPS. So if they're gonna get the $76 million from Virginia ratepayers, then that energy should be coming from Virginia. It requires the utilities to meet the RPS goals with a certain portion of energy coming from wind and solar. Clearly these are the two pieces of renewables that the, the environmental com community is most supportive of. Um, you know, there are some other questionable sources that are included in the renewable portfolio statute. So we'd like to see a more wind and solar, and obviously here in Virginia. And then the third piece is just eliminating that double and triple counting. And you're probably asking, well, but isn't that for wind and solar? It is, but considering that, again, they only need to um, meet 10% of our energy in 2025 by renewables, it doesn't make sense that they're allowed to double count, you know, one solar project or two wind projects or just, you know, one offshore wind project with that triple credit because we want to see more steel on the ground and so we don't think that really the double and triple counting helps incentivize actually getting more steel on the ground. The Commerce and Labor Committee is the committee that any energy bill goes through. So these are the current members. Um, please take a moment to look, see if your senator or delegate is on this list. Um, because if they are, we definitely need your help starting January 9th when session begins. Um, there will be one new addition to each committee. Um, unfortunately, Senator Miller did pass away, um, and Delegate Alexander, who was on the House Committee, ha has taken her Senate seat. So there will be um, one new addition on both of these committees, um, definitely. Uh, but that will not be determined until after session starts. So this is where you guys all come in. You can make a difference. And you can make a difference by, well, first of all, the first step is being here today, and thank you for that. It's so important that you guys understand the issues, understand um, how you can help us, especially if you live in the district of one of the folks that was on the previous slide, um, and go in and meet with them. Other ways that you can help us move the folks, move our targets, the folks that are on these committees, is writing letters to the editor. Um, you know, go and meet with them, get letters to the editor, make phone calls, ask your friends, family, and neighbors to make phone calls. Um, the more people they hear from, you know, the more they're going to listen to the issue. And obviously, with session being 45 days, rapid response is definitely needed. Sometimes we don't even know that the bill is going to come up in committee until 24 hours beforehand. Um, so definitely just being really attentive and knowing what's going on it is very important. 